Today we are going to examine several concepts integral to understanding the human ape, the chief among them being monogamy, and how a false perception and misunderstanding of human biology allowed for the belief in an unassailable traditionalism and more general society-wide delusion that crumbled to dust because of a fundamental misunderstanding of who we are as primates and animals. Moreover, we will be looking at how human biology interacts with the environment, creating new arrangements. Specifically, I will argue that female reproductive choices in terms of mate selection will always be the primary determinant of the course of civilization, and that feminism, for all its political trappings, is primarily a manifestation of deep female biological urges and instincts in extremis. And finally, I will be examining how evolutionary advantageous reproductive traits that served us well as a species in the past have become highly maladaptive to a mechanized and politicized environment that bears little to no resemblance whatsoever to the environment that had originally led to the development of those traits. One of the most important questions we need to ask ourselves as a species and a society is whether or not the human ape is in fact monogamous, and if so, if this monogamy encapsulates both social and genetic monogamy, or neither. To begin with, we need to understand that monogamy is not just monogamy, and biologists and anthropologists make several distinctions with regards to this, these being genetic monogamy, sexual monogamy, and social monogamy. Genetic monogamy describes two partners only having offspring with each other. Sexual monogamy refers to sexual exclusivity between two partners, but does not necessarily entail genetic monogamy. And social monogamy describes cohabitation, cooperation, as well as the sharing of resources between a pair. And we are asking this because modern society as a whole, and in particular traditionalist per perceptions of human relationships, are based in large measure on the belief that the human ape is primarily monogamous. And here I would like to emphasize the fact that it is just that, a perception with little grounding in reality. A fairy tale, like many others, we tell ourselves to ward off the evil spirits of a reality we'd prefer not to embrace on its own terms. To properly understand that human beings have never been a monogamous species, at least in a primary sense, we can examine morphological as well as genetic data that demonstrate this. And no discussion about monogamy is possible without first addressing the issue of sexual dimorphism and whether or not the human ape is primarily a pair bonding species or a tournament species. In evolutionary biology, it is generally thought that the larger the degree of sexual dimorphism in a species, the greater the likelihood of polygamy and polygamy here being defined as having multiple mating partners and being distinguished from polygamy, which exclusively refers to multiple marriage partners. When a species develops a high degree of sexual dimorphism, such as the far larger body mass of male gorillas compared to the smaller mass of female gorillas, we can assume that gorillas are highly polygynous, which they are. As one male, almost certainly the silverback, leads a harem of a group of females that he has exclusive sexual access to. The sexual dimorphism of gorillas is acknowledged to be the most prominent amongst primates. But what of humans? Those inclined to believe that monogamy is a primary practice among humans will cite the relatively minimal sexual dimorphism between the human male and female, Barring secondary sex traits as well as primary ones, men and women appear to be far more similar morphologically than are male and female gorillas, for example. But here we need to delve deeper into the question, because extreme sexual dimorphism in terms of body mass is not the only gauge and indication of polygamy in a species. There are other clues. For example, if we look at human male genital morphology, as stated in Gallup's article titled, semen displacement as a sperm competition strategy in humans. Quote, the penis evolved as an internal fertilization device. There are, however, striking differences in penis morphology between different species. In addition to the ostensible impact of female choice on the evolution of more elaborate male genitalia, 
There is reason to believe that sperm competition played a role in shaping the human penis. The human penis, with a relatively larger glands and more pronounced coronal ridge than is found in many other primates, may function to, to displace seminal fluid from rival males in the vagina by forcing it back under the glands. During intercourse, the effect of repeated thrusting would be to draw out and displace foreign semen away from the cervix. As a consequence, if a female copulated with a male or more than one male within a short period of time, this would allow subsequent males to scoop out semen deposited by others before ejaculating. We have to understand that virtually all morphological features of a species will have evolved as a result of selection pressures placed on them, in this case in the area of reproduction. Whilst male gorillas display a far larger body mass than do female gorillas, their penis is very small compared to the human males. And this is because selection pressures did not favor large penises of male gorillas, but rather large body mass, the result of which is one dominant male mating with all the females of the harem and remaining in that position for a very long time. Not so with the human male, which is why selection pressures favored a far larger penis with the theoretical applications described in the aforementioned citation, meaning that human females had to have been engaging in consistent polygonous, non-monogamous behavior for this morphological feature to have arisen in males in the first place. Had women been always been monogamous, the human male penis would have far more likely resembled that of a gorilla's. And this sheds light on the question of whether or not we are a pair bonding or tournament species, or perhaps a little of both, as those arguing that humans are primarily a pair bonding species are in error for two reasons. One is ignorance of genetic evidence, and the other, perhaps a simple, willful misunderstanding of what pair bonding actually is. And here I believe people are conflating the basic necessity of male and female association for the purposes of reproduction with pair bonding, effectively mistaking cultural and socially favored trends towards pair bonding for biologically driven motivation. To the extent that we are, it is minimal. We are, based on genetic evidence, as well as morphological evidence, primarily a tournament species that briefly dipped into an experiment of parabonding that now is in the modern era falling apart at the seams. But for now, we have cleared away the first part of the question, namely whether or not humans are primarily monogamous by nature, specifically whether human females are monogamous by nature. Genetic and social monogamy are both relatively recent occurrences in the pipeline of human evolution incredibly recent if we take into account just how much time is required for adaptive changes to take place in a species. Thus for a long time, the majority of our history, it was a few men breeding with all the women, with a downshift in overall reproductive success but an overall increase in the number of men who bred, and this only with the occurrence of a sedentary agrarian lifestyle. Before moving on to the implications of this, it would behoove us to have an actual look at the amount of time we as a species practice polygamy as a primary reproductive model versus the amount of time we as a species have practiced some form of monogamy. So let us say that modern humans have been around for roughly 150,000 years, and that for 132,000 of those years, humans have been principally and primarily polygonous up until 18,000 years ago, which means that monogamy as a reproductive strategy with any sort of currency has only been around for 12% of the time humans have existed, and for 88% of that time it hardly existed at all. And this is interesting because it explains something to us. When we were primarily a nomadic hunter-gatherer species, female reproductive preferences determined that only a few men, so-called alpha men, would reproduce with the majority, and why? Because it was the physically strong, brutish men that could best provide resources to women and defend them against the dangers of the world, and it remained the prevailing reproductive model until comparatively recently. With the onset of the agricultural age, we see a shift in the Y chromosome gene pool, with more men contributing to it, but with less overall reproductive success. But the question is, why is that? Put simply, the beta provider worker drone became the more viable mate in that environment because of its sedentary nature, and the need for someone to reliably work the land. In fact, if I were to use the metaphor of genetic alleles, 
This sort of man represented alleles of the gene of the common male with phenotype traits of reliability and fidelity specific to their allele. This then would have been preferable to the alpha brute of the hunter-gatherer era because that sort of man, whilst a better protect protector, likely would have lacked the reliability factor that would have been more advantageous in a sedentary ag agrarian environment. So we see a consistent pattern here, namely that the environment is the primary and determining factor that motivates female reproductive choice. And having said that, let's add a little addendum to Briefo's law. Once we understand that female reproductive drive is environmentally reactive, and the consequence of that drive will be dependent upon the environment she finds herself in, we can also understand the cycles of civilization, which Barbarossa talked about in a previous earlier video. If the agricultural age was the foreshadowing of modern traditionalism, then the industrial era was the embodiment of it. And here's where we begin to see a shift in female behavior due to changes in environment. I am, of course, speaking of the mechanization effect. People seem either to be puzzled or simply fail to pose the question at all as to why feminism grew so quickly during the late 19th century, because it was then that feminism rose to relative prominence. And it was then that we can speak of a tangible women's movement that was curiously absent prior to that time. And equally curious is the fact that it was a movement acted out by upper-class women, women with access to wealth. And here's the main point, access to rapid technological growth that already picked up, picked up steam during that time. You see where I'm going with this? It's not curious at all. Not really. Not if we understand how environmental shifts influence women and their behavior. Thus, it is no coincidence at all that it was wealthy women of that era that ran the feminist flag. And why? What do women seek after, first and foremost? Protection, provision, and security. And these women had these things in abundance by way of comparison to women of lesser socioeconomic status. Never before had women been so safe, and because of this, they wanted more. See hypergamy. And the accompanying technological boom, mechanized transportation, telecommunications, and the like, allowed women with this socioeconomic status even more freedom within the confines of the safety afforded to them by their husbands and society at large. This is a predictable outcome if we understand how hypergamy works. Female hypergamy only has a theoretical ceiling or limit to it, where the limit is defined by environmental limitations, either physical and or political, imposed on it, which is to say that women of that era having been accorded all the status they could have by way of their husbands, along with provision and security given to them, began to want even more. This is classic bigger, better deal thinking to a T, which is essentially what hypergamy is in actual practice, and meaning that industrialization, technological advancement, and the changes that these things brought about in the environment led to the first murmurings of what could be called feminism, because prior to that, the world was simply not secure or safe enough to push for a women's movement. And of course, it is no coincidence that it began in the upper echelons of society, in the echelons of the women who were most secure already. Moreover, as technology improved, the minimal labor contributions that women had previously made, such as in the household or in the fields, had ground to a halt, particularly in the case of wealthy women. Due to men's labor and innovations, their lives had reached the point when they could actively petition for even more. And so they did. And like a trickle-down effect, as modernity took hold and technology advanced still further, more and more women participated in liberating themselves from their quote-unquote alleged oppression until the 1960s and 70s, when the fully modern world was realized, and women from most socioeconomic strata had access to the conveniences and safety of industrialization and technological advancement. Feminism never was primarily a hate movement. It was, and always has been primarily, as Barbarossa put it, a female advocacy at all costs movement, where securing protection and provision is the main goal and always has been. Hate certainly exists, but to the extent that it does, it is just a byproduct, since politicized feminism is an outward manifestation of women's innermost drives in the most extreme form. Those drives for safety, provision, protection, security, at all costs, heedless of the damage 
that is done to others in the process. And the irony should be lost to no one that functional traditionalism, which arguably could be said to have begun in the agricultural era, also led eventually to the kinds of innovations which later rendered it obsolete as a reproductive model. Traditionalism was always predicated on the notion of human nature as static and unchanging, still more so on ignorance of female responsiveness to environmental change. When by the 60s the world had become completely non-threatening and women had access to modern amenities en masse, that is when the show really kicked off. So effectively, what can be seen is an environmental shift we can call the mechanization effect that force women to reassess their positions and benefits via vis-a-vis -vis men. Recall my addendum to Briefo's Law. Just as they had done 18,000 years ago, when the shift to an agrarian culture led them to reassess, at least partially, their preference for alpha brutes in favor of beta providers, because those providers were more conducive to women's provision and safety in that particular environment. What mechanization did, however, was create a completely new environment that rendered traditionalism increasingly obsolete because the environment had changed such that women were no longer required to rely primarily on male labor for many things. And when feminism was essentially written to law, enacted, of course, by men, any illusion of reliance on beta provision became a distant memory. And given that social and genetic monogamy have only been around for a comparatively brief period of time, coupled by female responsiveness to environmental change, is it any wonder that many women have returned to the far older paradigm of polygyny and simultaneously pairing with the equivalent of Pleistocene alphas and with either the state or a cuckolded beta provider take care of the children? The modern era of 2013 offers the perfect environment for the female to seek out what they instinctually feel is optimized genetic material in the form of alpha thugs whilst relying on beta provider and or state provision to nourish the product of these unions. Feminism, when seen in this light, is simply the culmination of something that always was there, akin to a dam holding back a vast torrent of water, waiting to burst, where the water is hypergamy without a ceiling, and the dam was an environment hitherto too dangerous to allow for the exploration of the upper limits of hypergamy. When the dam burst, it eventually led to what I simply will call runaway hypergamy, a hyperinflated form of it with no caps on it whatsoever. Part of understanding the puzzle of runaway hypergamy has already been discussed at length, namely government acting out the role of both protector and provider, buying votes with promises of protection and rewards to women who will act out their hypergamous instincts on a political level. But there is a more striking element to all of this, and it has nothing to do with the government, and little to do with politics, which is why the quote-unquote just shrink the government crowd displays such appalling ignorance sometimes. I am, of course, speaking of social media, the internet, which I would argue has a far more profound effect on people's perceptions, and in particular on women's perceptions of themselves and their prospective mates. When a populace is bombarded 24-7 with images of wealth, fame, and luxury, viewable by a click of the mouse, these images become integrated into their worldview, and they begin to see and perceive these images as a normative standard not just in terms of the external world, but also in terms of the internal world, their world. Most of the things they see are, by and large, inaccessible to them, but the presence of such a barrage of images leads them to erroneously believe that these things are readily accessible to them. In woman, this leads to a hyperinflation of her own perceived value, and by extension to her interactions with the world, and in particular the world of men. A woman who grows up and is regularly exposed to film, TV, and YouTube clips of the highest echelons of men in the dominance hierarchy, wealthy entrepreneurs, entertainers, rock and movie stars, believes that these men lie within the purview of her ability to acquire them, even if the woman is just a plain Jane Doe and is little more than a 5.5. The evolutionary premise for hypergamy is sound but the execution of hypergamy in the modernized and mechanized age is not subject to rational introspection or thought. It is merely acted out. Which is why a man who might be a 7 is considered subpar to a woman who is a 5.5. 5. 5. 
hence why I've termed it runaway hypergamy. If you recall the 2010 OKCupid OK poll, uh, the poll where women claimed 80% of men on the site were below average, that's a reflection of this phenomenon. I call it runaway because it has no boundaries placed on it anymore, and constant media exposure ensures that it remains this way and will likely remain so into the foreseeable future, which is why simply changing the laws would have only a minimal effect, because those changes would not encompass any changes in social media outlet or internet. Even in the unlikely event of governmental collapse, the technologies that have become akin to oxygen and water to us shall almost certainly remain in place and continue to grow. Human behavior is based on a specific environment, which was the plains of Africa well over 100,000 years ago, and given time, humans can adapt. But the rate of technological advancement cannot be adapted to, because we simply do not have tens of thousands of years to do so. Which leads me to my final point, and let me be clear. I have never once used the term flawed to describe either male or female behavior. But at this juncture in time, I have no qualms whatsoever by calling it maladaptive to our current world and environment. Hypergamy serves increasingly little purpose in an automatized world where women are perfectly capable of doing well for themselves, coupled by overexposure to media resources, which leads to a form of hypergamy that reaches for the stratosphere with no limits and no caps. Likewise, Men's innate desire to protect and provide for women serves little purpose in an environment that has never been safer, and where women can earn their own living, and this desire to protect and provide for has reached the point of self-immolation, or as Barbara Russ has described it, is a simply a failed reproductive strategy because the current climate is very dangerous to men, and when men indulge in their baser instincts they often are exposed to that danger. My thesis is simple. All of civilization is driven by male industry and competition, but that drive itself is bound to the direction women choose in terms of reproduction, where in the past she favored one type of male, then another, and now in the current age the whole system has effectively gone haywire, and the environmental changes are such that women will never go back to beta male provision or to anything even remotely along those lines accept that. And yet we still maintain the airs of the days of yesteryear, when everything was allegedly different. We maintain a pretense of social and genetic monogamy when it was never there in the first place. And why? For the usual reasons. People are often far more comfortable with fairy tales than they are with reality. Because reality tells us that we are animals, specifically apes. And as such, our behavior follows a very specific and very predictable reproductive trajectory that can be studied, observed, and if so desired, firmly understood. Moreover, people all too often conflate that which they wish to be with that which is true, when the two are mutually exclusive. But again, this is a derivative of our desire to deceive ourselves with comforting truths. Perhaps it is, at the end of the day, our very sentience, itself a fortuitous byproduct of evolution on the plains of Africa, that makes us believe we are somehow different, that gorillas and baboons and chimpanzees may behave thus, but we exist outside of that paradigm. Do we, with our relative intelligence, seek to deceive ourselves into believing we are more than the human ape? I firmly believe so. Changing laws in light of this would be tantamount to putting a band-aid on a terminally ill cancer patient. If, and that's a big if, change is to occur, it can only occur if both men and women become fully aware of what they are, namely animals with relatively large brain mass, a brain mass that all too often leads to self-deception and complex narratives of rationalization when simpler ones would do us far greater justice in making some kind of genuine progress. Thanks for watching.